Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Sean Narayan on the new ASEAN in the 21st century. Hello and welcome to Season 4 of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welsh, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the uh, University of Waterloo and also Senior Fellow at uh, CG. And uh, this season, I'm very pleased to announce that I will be sharing hosting duties for Inside the Issues with my colleague, Andrew Thompson, of the Balsley School, uh, whom you will see in this seat uh, from time to time. Uh, but today, to kick us off, I'm pleased to welcome Sean Narayan, who's Associate Professor of uh, International Relations at St. Thomas University and one of Canada's uh, premier scholars of Southeast Asian politics. Mm -hmm. Far, far removed geographically yes. from, uh, from much of Canada, but uh, an important, an increasingly important part of the world. Yes. So you're uh, mm -hmm. on, doing a book at the moment, uh, which is with luck nearing completion, uh, with the title of um, The New ASEAN in the 21st Century. And I'm sure our uh, viewers have all mm -hmm. heard about ASEAN and uh, know a little bit about ASEAN, but uh, as you've explained to me, it's a very complex beast. So maybe we can uh, set the scene a bit with just a little bit of background and history on ASEAN yes. and where it came from. Certainly, yeah, I'd happy to do that. Uh, yeah, ASEAN is, 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 first off, it stands for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And it's a very interesting animal. Um, it came into existence in 1967. And at that point in time, ASEAN was created largely as a sort of uh, a pact between its member states that, that they would not that, that they would essentially try to interact with each other peacefully. It came as a direct result of a confrontation, a military and social and political confrontation between Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and Singapore. And after this, this ended, this confrontation ended, uh, the countries of Southeast Asia who had been each other's, at each other's throats at this period realized that they could hurt one another. And so the desire to avoid for future conflict meant that they needed to come up with some kind of mechanism to smooth over problems in the future, and ASEAN was the immediate solution. And whose um, idea was it? Well, that's a little bit complicated. There had already been a previously existing organization called the Association of Southeast Asia, and it did not have Indonesia as a member. And so when Indonesia wanted to join ASEAN or join a new regional organization that would help to smooth its relations with its neighbors, it could not join something that it was not part of creating. And so the other countries decided, yes, we will take the ASA and essentially fold it into ASEAN and call it something new, even though it's building on the foundation of what had come before. And the one commonality that all the states at this point in time had with each other was that they were all concerned with uh, uh, co communist insurgencies. And so this common thread of being anti-communist ran through the member states at the time, uh, who were Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Thailand, and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And now, was the fact that the Vietnam War was, was raging at the time uh, related at all to the creation of ASEAN, or was it a not? Issue? It was a separate issue in many ways, though, though the things certainly inter interacted with each other, uh, those two events. One of the arguments I've always made consistently is that when you look at the evolution of ASEAN, how it's grown and changed over the years, it's almost always been driven by external events. So something has happened in the larger outside environment that has forced these, these countries to decide to move on to the next step in the organization's development. In this instance, after 1967, there was a period of time where internal conflict between the Philippines and, and uh, Malaysia actually sort of paralyzed ASEAN for a time. And then in 1969, uh, the Guam Doctrine was expressed by Richard Nixon, and that created the impetus for the ASEAN states to, to put aside their differences, because the United States was saying to everyone, after the Vietnam War, we're no longer going to get involved directly in whatever conflicts you may have or whatever internal uh, communist insurgencies might exist. And so this perception of external threat created the extra impetus to say, okay, we better put our, our own conflicts aside for good in order to, you know, deal with this new problem the Americans have presented us with. Mm -hmm. Now, how has it grown? You said it's grown since the beginning. Well, it's grown in a couple of ways. Uh, right now, ASEAN consists of 10 countries. So it started out with five, and over the intervening 46 years, now they very recently had their 46th anniversary, um, it's now acquired five new members. Um, and in fact, uh, East Timor will probably join at some point in the future to make it 11 countries. 
Um, but it's also, and to me this is one of the more, the more interesting elements of it, it's also evolved in terms of what it actually is. And what I mean by that is that many people who don't know too much about ASEAN sort of think of it as an economic organization. But for the first 20, 25 years of its existence, it was most notable as a failure as an economic organization. More than anything, it was a political pact between its members. Um, and later on in the 19, um, late 1970s, throughout the 1980s, it was an organization around which um, its various members combined to oppose one very specific incident, which was Vietnam's invasion and occupation of Cambodia. Um, it was after, only after the Cold War ended that ASEAN really started to become, in any effective way, an economic organization. And, and that was happening again in response to external events, in this instance, the end of the Cold War. And so one of the really interesting things about this is how it's moved and shifted as time has gone on. In fact, in some respects, like at the end of the Cold War, ASEAN had this determination to continue to exist, which meant that it had to find new purposes for itself to organize around, um, which in itself is interesting because it means, it seems to imply that the members of the state, member states realized that there was some value in having this organization. They didn't just say, well, the Cold War is over, our purpose has been served, let's go our separate ways. But at the same time, they seemed to feel that simply recognizing the advantages of having a cooperative organization that allowed them to interact with each other on a regular basis wasn't enough to keep it going. So they needed other purposes to orient themselves around. Hmm. No, it's not like NATO. It's not a military alliance. And it's not like the European Union. It doesn't have all these supranational institutions that sort of integrate and regulate and permeate sovereignty. Is it like anything else, or is it a unique beast? I would argue it seems unique. Now, for many years, ASEAN was called the most successful um, Th um, 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 international organization in the third world. Um, and in recent years, while I still think that's largely true, I think that title has been challenged to some degree. For example, you see the organization of um, American states, you see um, the African Union, and both of them have introduced something that ASEAN has fairly strongly resisted, which is the right of the organization to actually violate the sovereignty of its members under, under certain circumstances. Uh, and in the case of the OIS, not necessarily violate, but certainly comment on events that may happen within, within member states. And ASEAN, one of its fundamental organizing principles is that the respect for sovereignty is absolutely sacred. And this continues to be something that it's held on to very powerfully, even though in recent years it's begun to, to, to fudge some of that to some degree. So it's introduced, for example, an ASEAN charter, which now for the first time has given the organization sort of a legal personality. And the ASEAN charter seems to suggest in some of its passages that sovereignty and the ability to comment on what's happening domestically to a state is now within the playing field. You know, it's something they might be willing to do. But at the same time, there are other provisions in the same charter that reinforce the idea of sovereignty and non-intervention in good. member states. Very interesting. Well, we'll follow up on those uh, in a minute with Sean Narayan. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So ASEAN is uh, sui generis, it's its own thing. Um, principle of sovereignty, uh, sovereignty is at its heart, but is it generating any kind of uh, mutual identification? Are we starting to see uh, the development of a distinctively ASEAN identity? And yeah. if so, how is that manifesting itself and what difference does that make to what it does? Yeah, those are fundamental questions that those of us who study ASEAN are always arguing about. Um, my take on it, I'm a bit of an ASEAN skeptic, but the position that I take on this particular issue is that there definitely is an ASEAN identity, and it is manifesting itself primarily among the, the different 
ruling, ruling groups who run the societies, you know, the, the government elites, the academic elites, people like that. At the same time, though, they are also, my argument is that ASEAN identity is only one identity. And like, like all of us, um, these elites have multiple identities. And when you put the ASEAN identity in the overall hierarchy of identities that are important to them, it's very low down the totem pole. And so what it means is that while there is an identity, and while you can see certain indications of this, you know, polls have shown that most people in ASEAN countries at least have an idea that such a thing exists, at the same time, they don't necessarily know what it does. Um, so among the general public, I think there's a very weak sense of ASEAN identity if it's there at all, though, again, polls on this are mixed. Among the elites, there's a stronger sense of both ASEAN identification and awareness of ASEAN, but again, the fundamental issue is when push comes to shove and you have to choose between the interests of one identity versus that of the ASEAN identity, which, takes, which, which, which actually takes a, a pre pre precedence. And my argument is that when you look at the historical record, there's almost no evidence to suggest, with a couple of exceptions, that individual ASEAN states and their leaders have put the interests of the organization ahead of the interests of their state. But it's hard to gauge this because, of course, when your organization puts such priority on sovereignty, then in fact, you could really argue it's not designed to ever create a situation where the interests of the state have to come into competition with the interests of the, of the organization. But you said there are some exceptions, so this has well, the one, cropped up occasionally. Yes, and the one notable exception to this is that during the Vietnam-Cambodia invasion era of ASEAN, Indonesia and Malaysia too very strongly felt their strategic interpretation of the, the, the region in which they were in which they found themselves was that China was a much bigger long-term threat to the security of Southeast Asia than Vietnam was. And both of them were very unhappy with taking measures that were designed to weaken Vietnam. But Thailand, which was essentially driving ASEAN policy at that time, had formed an alliance with China to, to weaken Vietnam, and it was the, the so-called frontline state. It was the country sharing a border with Cambodia and concerned about what would happen if you know, Vietnam decided to become more aggressive through Cambodia. And so Indonesia and Malaysia were willing to put aside their own very strong strategic interpretation of this, this problem in order to maintain uh, a unified front within ASEAN itself. Now, as time went on, this front really did begin to, to crack. And if the, the Cold War had not come to an end when it did, I would argue that inevitably ASEAN would have fractured hmm. along these lines. Um, the signs were already there, but for a long time, for almost a decade, Indonesia was willing to say, okay, we'll do put this aside for the sake of ASEAN unity. Now, another way to look at it, though, is that Indonesia was actually making a calculation of its interest, and at some level it believed that keeping a unified ASEAN would be useful to it over the long term. But it's a more, that's a more abstract argument, and certainly in the short term, it didn't like what it was doing, but it did it anyway. And now Vietnam and Cambodia are members. Absolutely, right. yes. In fact, Vietnam joined uh, quite quickly in 1995, um, and then Cambodia came in, well, later on in 1999. So is it primarily a security organization? Is that the bulk of their business? And what kinds of security issues does ASEAN tend to take on as a group? Yes, I would say that it's primarily a political institution. Um, and security only in the sense of security writ very large. Um, right now, and, and this is another stage in the evolution of ASEAN, ASEAN is trying to create a, an ASEAN c c community by 2015. And the argument is that it, has, it will consist of three pillars. Um, one pillar is an ASEAN economic community, the other is the ASEAN um, social cultural community, and then the third one is the ASEAN political, social, and, and, and uh, security community. Yes, I, I keep mixing up the P and the S. I think it's the political security community. Mm -hmm. And there you have these three different pillars on which this ASEAN community will be built. And so there, there's sort of this intention to directly address security issues. But then your question is, what does that mean? The ASEAN has something called the ASEAN Regional Forum, 
which consists right now of, I think, 26 countries, including all the big powers. And it is really a diplomatic um, initiative. It, it has no, no, there's no effort to create any kind of a military um, regime. There's no effort to create any kind of mutual security pact or anything of that nature. It's entirely a place where countries can meet to discuss issues of concern to each other, to smooth over issues that have a security orientation that might lead to conflict or problems further down the road. Mm -hmm. um, Amitav Acharya has argued that one of the, the conditions of ASEAN, in fact, one of its norms, is that it will not form a security or, or a military organization. Now again, the arguments around this, I think he's right, but I also think that the possibility of them forming a military union was something that did come out when the organization was first being created. Um, Indonesia, again, sort of floated the idea, but the other member states were not, not interested. Because and they were scared of Indonesia. Exactly, because in many ways they saw ASEAN as a way to constrain Indonesia. Right. And, and sort of being in the, in the tub with the crocodile was not something that the rest of them wanted to do. Um, over the years, this has changed to some degree. But at the same time, the actual security relationships that most ASEAN countries have, even the ones that have outside security relationships, um, is with the United States. Hmm. And so they're part of the San Francisco system, at least many of them. Um, to one degree or another, and some of them have less formalized but then equally strong relationships. Very good. We'll be back again in a minute with Sean Narayan to talk more about ASEAN. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So I'd like to talk a, a bit about the challenges of the 21st century. I, I guess the agenda has evolved much as the organization has evolved. But uh, as I understand it, one of the things you're particularly interested in is how this group of, in the grand scheme of things, relatively small countries has been relating to the relatively big countries. And uh, one of the interesting things about uh, Asia Pacific politics is that ASEAN has somehow or, or another acquired almost a kind of pride of place in at least the security governance of the region, which doesn't seem to square with our traditional realist assumptions about how international politics work. So India, China, the United States, they're all on the side, uh, on the margin, uh, occasionally participating with ASEAN countries in one of those uh, plus something uh, categories, but uh, not central. And yet, Yet ASEAN has somehow managed uh, to uh, survive and do its thing and um, neither fall prey to nor kowtow to the great powers. How, how has that worked? That's really quite a remarkable thing. Yeah. I'd be, what I would say is that this has all happened by default. And um, it's a really interesting dynamic because when you look at it, the Asia-Pacific region is one area of the world, maybe, maybe the only area of the world, where all of the great powers of the 21st century are interacting. And essentially what this has meant is that to one degree or another, they've held each other in check. And so the only entity that has any possibility of bringing them all together is the one relatively weak entity called ASEAN which already exists, which, which involves you know, 10, 11, or potentially 11 member states, but which is not a threat to anybody. And so it has managed to make itself uh, the center of the ARF, the ASEAN Regional Forum. So the one indigenous security dialogue that goes on in the region is centered around ASEAN. Um, there's the ASEAN plus three, which is the ASEAN plus China, Japan, and South Korea. And that's an effort to create sort of financial um, breaks and financial, uh, financial firewall around the Asia Pacific to protect it again from future um, Asian economic crises like happened in 1997. Um, most recently, there's the East Asian Summit, which now um, the United States actually joined that in 2011. So now many other of the big powers are involved in or participating in ASEAN-led or at least ASEAN-centered organizations. But what's going on here is actually quite complicated because the initial outbreak, the initial explosion of institutionalism that occurred in the late 1990s, early 2000s, was really driven by China. Uh, China recognized after 1997, 1999, 
and the Asian economic crisis, China recognized the advantages of, of a multilateral region. And I think it saw itself, it saw the potential for its own leadership in building multilateral institutions. But at the same time, it recognized that if it was going to do so, it was far better to try to lead from behind. And so it was more than willing to pay homage to ASEAN and to encourage ASEAN and to, to in many ways, force other big powers to pay more attention to ASEAN because China was, was, was paying them so much heed. And so the ARF, which came into existence in 1994, one of the big reasons that it's existed for as long as it has and it has a certain amount of cachet is because China insisted that ASEAN be the leading force within it, in part because it also liked China's uh, or ASEAN's norms. You know, again, China is also a nation country that has great respect for and greatly promotes the idea of the sovereign rights of states. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that ASEAN had the same belief was, was clearly something that drew them together. Um, now, in recent years, China has muddied the water somewhat because it has become more aggressive, particularly in the South China Sea. And this has made many of the regional states, many of the ASEAN states, much more suspicious of what it's doing. But it hasn't been enough to in any way derail the institutional development um, that have gone, has gone on and that has maintained ASEAN's um, function and focus in, in the post-Cold War era. So I argue that there's actually two, there are two different dimensions of what's going on here. On the one hand, there's ASEAN itself, which is trying to create itself as a more unified internal structure. So it's, it's trying to, as I mentioned earlier, create an ASEAN co community by the year 2015. And that seems to mean making it a more integrated, more well-rounded economic and security and social cultural entity. Um, at the same time, it's also at the heart of many of the institutional developments that have gone on that have extended beyond Southeast Asia and into the larger region. And these two things come together in the sense that many ASEAN countries understand that their ability to be politically influential within these institutions is going to be strongly connected to how unified they are amongst themselves. Their ability to speak with a single voice will give them a greater amount of impact within forums like the APT or the EAS or the ASEAN Regional Forum. But what has added a further level of complication to all of this is that the aspiration for unity aside, the reality is often that, as I mentioned earlier, ASEAN states have great difficulty putting aside their narrow national self-interest to work together cooperatively. And that hasn't changed. In mm. fact, bringing in the five additional states, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, um, Myanmar, and um, I'm missing one, but I'll get it later. Um, that has made the whole ASEAN dynamic much more complicated. It's meant that countries that are at a much lower social and economic level of development and which have very particular interests or the interest of developing world states are not necessarily ready to open up and become part of a of a larger free trade deal for example and so intra-ASEAN dynamics remain very mm -hmm. complex and will, as far as I can tell will remain very complex well into the future at the same time the larger regional dynamics are increasingly complicated as well as these bigger powers try to sort of jockey for position in the region. And leaders need followers, and so they're all to one extent or another courting the ASEAN countries. And the ASEAN countries want to be courted, but recognize their own difficulties in creating a unified front, which will make their ability to be something worth courting much more, more solid. Mm. So it's a very complicated dynamic in what's going on. And as I said to other people in the past, I think part of what makes ASEAN work is that it's a bit of an illusion. Outsiders look at it and they assume a level of unity and a level of coherence that doesn't necessarily exist. In fact, I would argue that doesn't exist. But they react in many ways as though it is unified. And that gives ASEAN a, an influence that in many respects it really doesn't merit. But, but as long as nobody really tests it on these scores, then the illusion continues. The Wizard of Oz all over again. In a sense. I, I don't want to be quite that harsh, but it's a, very, it's a very difficult thing to do. And I would say, the last point I would make here is that 
many people seem to think that the ASEAN countries sort of have a choice about whether or not they're going to give sovereignty the kind of, of, of weight that they do. And I would argue that it's actually not that simple, that to one extent or another, almost actually every single ASEAN state is concerned about its overall stability. And it's only when you're really secure in your own stability that any country even considers giving up sovereignty. And so the ASEAN countries, unless they can see some definite benefit to giving up sovereignty that will actually enhance their sovereignty and their stability in the long term, it's quite reasonable for them to say that we're not going to give up any more sovereignty than we absolutely have to. It makes perfect sense in a, in a paradoxical yeah. kind of way. Yeah. Be back one last time with Sean Narayan. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So China sort of thinks it's leading from behind, and ASEAN thinks it's um, containing and managing China. And, there's a nice coincidence of uh, mutual misperceptions there. What about India and what about the United States? Other, uh, well, India is an increasingly yeah. important regional player and the United States never really went away. How do they interact with ASEAN and what's their attitude toward it? Yeah, well, I, I'll step back for a second and say I, I don't think that China feels it's leading from behind necessarily anymore. I think it's aware that it's complicated its situation and it's opened the door, right. therefore, to, to the United States returning, for example. So one of the really interesting dynamics of the past decade had been that from 1997 to about 2007, China had done a remarkably good job of alleviating many of the regional states' fears about what would happen when China becomes the biggest power in the region and the biggest power in the world. Um, and they, like I said, they were remarkably successful in making most of the regional elites feel that China would be a good neighbor well into the future. And this had blocked um, the United States to a significant degree. The Americans, um, whose, whose raison d'etre in, in, in Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific is largely, uh, the Americans are of course a major economic player, but much of their role in the region is providing security. Mm -hmm. and, and they were aware that, that they saw China as a major challenge, a major threat to their dominance. But they had no easy way to get the regional states to agree to see China in the same way. And so the Americans were deeply frustrated by the fact that China was so successful um, in playing off um, the smaller states. After 2007, and particularly around 2009, 2010, China started becoming more aggressive in the South China Sea. And that has opened the door to the United States. And the Americans have rushed through um, with, with quite a bit of glee to resume and build up um, their relationships, their military relationships, their security relationships with many of the countries of Southeast Asia again. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very important role the Americans have traditionally played of providing security for the region, of providing stability because they're seen as an outside power with no vested interest in what goes on. This has been reinforced to a significant degree um, in recent years. Was that a Chinese mistake? And if so, do they see it that way? I think it was a Chinese mistake, and many Chinese scholars see it that way too. But, but, there, but it's a bit more complicated than that, because there are many Chinese scholars who do feel that what was happening was that other countries were taking advantage of China's goodwill. And so things were happening in the South China Sea that were not supposed to be happening. You know, economic development without China's okay, you know, things hadn't been resolved and yet Vietnam and other countries were trying to, to build up economic uh, activity. And so China felt that it was being taken advantage of and it pushed back. I think China really miscalculated, however, because it had so much to lose by pushing back because there was already so, so much fear built up over what it could be that in doing this, it's created enough damage to its own diplomatic relations that it will have a much harder time pulling itself out from under the mess it's, it's, it's now mm. created for itself. So it'll take a much more effort to get back to where it was in 2007. And yet ASEAN can't get together on the South China Sea because they've got their own conflicting overlapping claims. Exactly. Uh, there are many conflicting overlapping claims among the ASEAN countries themselves. Um, many of them have claims that are just as questionable as the Chinese claim. And also, and this complicates the issue further, there are members of ASEAN whose economic relationship with China 
is very, very powerful. And uh, we saw this recently, in fact. Last year, Cambodia uh, blocked a, a common statement coming out of the ASEAN, uh, the usual ASEAN uh, ministerial meeting, apparently because China asked it to. Hmm. And this was a, a demonstration of China's ability to reach into ASEAN and create disruptive effects if it chose to do so. Now, my argument there would be that China miscalculated there as well, but let me, let me return to the United States and India. Um, so the United States now has new possibilities and new opportunities in the region that it never entirely lost, but which now are being strengthened by the fears that other regional states now have about China that had been alleviated earlier. In the case of India, India is very interesting because in the past, it was never much of a major player in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. But in recent years, it's become more and more active. It has a look east policy, which means it's trying to develop Asia, its Asia-Pacific relations. It's a new emerging economic power in the, in the world. And it sees Asia, as everyone else does, as a place that has enormous potential for economic development. And it wants to capitalize on that. At the same time, it also is recognizing the uncertainty that Chinese activities have created in the South China Sea and the region as a whole. Now, India and China have a, an ongoing rivalry. It, and sometimes it's, it's, it's quite hot. Most of the time, it's relatively cool. But China has tried to sort of surround India in a way. It's tried to make uh, or create very strong relationships with all of the South Asian countries surrounding India, many of which India has uh, abused in the past. India is now starting to respond to that by trying to build up a sort of a counter ring um, of Southeast Asian allies and Southeast Asian colleagues that it can appeal to and, and sort of counter what India, China is doing by, by going behind China and creating another circle encircling China. At the same time, Ch India and Japan have created a much stronger security relationship. Economically, they're not that closely bound, but that has the potential to grow as well. But in terms of security, they are seeing each other as very real potential allies and very real um, possible allies uh, working together to help offset China. And so what China has done in, in many ways, it's, it's created the opportunity for its its possible antagonists to get together. And it's given them good reason to get together. And it's also antagonized many smaller states that it didn't need to. In fact, one of uh, my colleagues has uh, said that no country has been more successful at building security ties in the Asia Pacific than China. Unfortunately, it's built all those security ties against it. Right. Um, well, it's a fascinating part of the world and a complicated one, and we'll uh, look forward to your book to help us try to uh, navigate it and uh, to see how ASEAN develops in the face of all of these challenges. And in particular, I'll be interested to see whether there's any real substance to those, uh, those community efforts. Uh, 2015 strikes me as a rather near-term goal to do something so dramatically different from what it's been done all along. But we shall see, and uh, perhaps we'll have you come back in and give us a retrospective look on some of those developments. So thank you again for coming and sharing your insight and wisdom. And thank you to the audience for uh, joining us today. And please join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issue. It's a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.